Hello and welcome everyone. I am your host, Phil Klein, and I've been working with the IDRC Cancer Research of United Kingdom and research team as we've been harvesting some best stories to share with you today. And I'm also joined by Medea Ahmed from IDRC, and we want to welcome our partners from CRUK and IDRC who have made highlighting the economics of tobacco control initiative possible today and such a powerful initiative over the many years we've been engaged. We're also grateful for all of you who are joining and how many of you have participated. We'll be highlighting a set of speakers during our session today and also recording this for future viewing. The work we are doing and have been learning from and celebrating today comes from many, many people from all over the world. And uh, so thank you so much for joining. So uh, with that, I wanna uh, welcome Medea. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome all. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, I will be brief because today is all about hearing from the researchers. Um, we acknowledge that Montreal, York Yoge, and Ottawa, two of the many places from which we are speaking from, are built on the unceded indigenous lands of the Ganye Gahaga and the Algonquin Anishinaabe nations, respectively. We recognize these nations as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada and around the globe. And onwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Medea, for that. All right. So next up. We have a wonderful journey today with a wide range of speakers and video presentations. And we'll be taking a journey really that goes from the research end of the spectrum through to policy impacts and changes and to partnerships that have made a powerful and transformational difference, as well as collaborations that are uh, inter-organizational and international. And we'll be discussing ways and sharing um, stories from the field and how communication strategies, all of which together have led to impact. And to really help us set the stage for this, we have Rima Nakash. Rima Nakash is a, uh, is a, a powerful speaker who will be sharing with us as the uh, Associate Professor in Global and Community Health from the American University of Beirut. Uh, Rima, welcome and thank you so much for joining and helping us set the context for uh, today. Thank you, Phil. So good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, great to hear the land acknowledgement from Madiha. Um, so happy to be in the presence of all my colleagues here today and all the attendees uh, who have interest in this webinar today. In setting the stage today, I will be highlighting three key messages. First, that tobacco control requires a multidisciplinarity approach and a systems thinking lens. I will talk about the importance of knowledge translation and how it could be done and the necessity of keeping track uh, of the tobacco industry uh, and their tactics. So in, this, in setting the stage, a little bit about what got me here. I started my early career involved in a community-based cardiovascular disease prevention project. It was guided by the socio-ecological model that acknowledges the interplay between the individual relationships, uh, the community, societal factors for prevention, and the necessity to act across multiple levels and sustain prevention efforts over time and to achieve population level impact. Of course, at that time, tobacco use, as, as it still is, was the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And, and our intervention tackled other cardiovascular disease risk factors too at multiple levels of the socio-ecological model and included a group-based smoking cessation intervention. For all those factors that were addressed, there was, however, no policy level intervention. Intervention as it was, this policy level intervention was outside the scope of the funding and the timeline of the grant. Now, working closely with community in a community-based participatory research approach, I experienced how individual level behavior change interventions fail when enabling structural policy level interventions were lacking. 
I developed this interest in studying further policy level interventions. It was evident through evaluations with community members and their experiences in smoking cessation that they faced continuous relapse and failure to overcome addiction in an environment that was not enabling for change. There were so many factors at play too, such as weak existing policies for tobacco, no bans of smoking in public places, cheap and affordable tobacco products, still the case in many countries, ubiquitous advertising, of course, tobacco industry free reign, and et cetera, et cetera. So a very weak tobacco control policy frameworks. And that was around the same time that there was a major landmark lawsuit taking place, which accelerated and advanced the tobacco control policy globally. And it's related to this photo you have here, and I'm sure many of you might probably have seen this before. It's the well-known photo of tobacco company CEOs, seven of them declaring under oath that nicotine was not addictive at the time when the internal tobacco industry documents revealed that they knew uh, that it was. And following a series of trials, which you know made those internal tobacco industry documents public, uh, we were able to understand the devious practices of the industry and their efforts in undermining tobacco control. The fact that tobacco smoking was a commercially driven behavior was outrageous. And, and that's what hooked me more to, to tobacco control research. And to thinking of tobacco use more with a systems thinking perspective, what does that mean? So in her book, Donella Meadows, uh, she's an American environmental scientist and educator. She authored this book, um, uh, Thinking in Systems, that I urge people to consider reading. And she notes two points in systems thinking which are very relevant to tobacco control. The first, that she makes is to consider city. As a public health professional, I totally agree with that, as I'm sure many of you would too. Complexity, health is a complex as it's the result of many determinants that interact. We said social determinants of health, the political and the commercial determinants of health. This complexity is also very relevant to tobacco control as a public health problem. And that's what makes advancing tobacco control ever more challenging. And her second point is to approach problems from a multidisciplinary approach. She says, and she terms it, defy the disciplines. And in fact, this echoes with us as public health professionals and particularly tobacco research, which draws on many disciplines. This approach is necessary for researchers to adequately understand and address this complex nature of tobacco use and the consequent health problems. Understanding the complex problems of tobacco use and tobacco control requires a true uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach and collaboration. Meadows was referring to a team science approach, and it's a collaborative effort that brings together scientific, uh, scientific challenge, leverages on the strength and expertise of various trained uh, uh, professionals uh, in different fields to solve problems uh, that are of complex nature. And of course, the team science approach requires not only time, but more important elements. For example, is it possible to imagine a collaboration that does not have trust at its foundations? Is it possible to imagine a group working together in an integrated manner, a, a scientific uh, team science approach without a shared vision, without awareness of team members um, and how to navigate social relationships, how to lead where everybody can lead in their own way and recognize credit uh, and leverage on networks uh, and connections. Now in this overall reality, there is a lot of public health research that's generated and, uh, and there's a lot of accumulating public health evidence, specifically in relation to tobacco control. But this accumulation of knowledge, more importantly, this research by itself does little to affect change. Why? Because in this complex system that we're in, we need to acknowledge that researchers are part of the policy system. Policies are the product of many factors, belief systems, actors that are concerned with a given policy. It includes legislators, civil servants, different interest groups and others concerned with the problem in question like journalists and academics. It doesn't suddenly happen, so policy doesn't suddenly happen. It unfolds over time, and researchers must understand that these forces all compete for influence. And, and so long-term policy change happens by the strategic interaction of those groups together to change, to, to lead to change and impact. For this reason, we need to actively seek impact to affect change. Here is where knowledge translation comes in. Rather than leave it to chance or time for our work and evidence, to be heard, taken up, and used, knowledge translation comes as the science behind how we need to be doing this systematically. Knowledge translation promotes engagement with policymakers and research users, 
via platforms to support them in making evidence-informed decisions. Maybe sometimes decisions are made only based on political priorities, but knowledge translation works to ensure that policymaking is linked to the best evidence available. So think about three different situations, a setting where this research process and policymaking are completely detached, a setting which a setting we are totally familiar with in many, in many contexts, a setting where the research process and policymaking are linked somehow, but maybe unintentionally, by chance, maybe some evidence is interpreted, some is misinterpreted, maybe it's poorly informed. And the third setting that we want to aim for is where knowledge translation is in the middle. It's between research and policymaking. It takes research and links policymaking uh, for better impact and better outcomes. And it can work both ways. It can be initiated by policymakers who can provide the topic for researchers and vice versa. Uh, uh, as uh, we are usually familiar with. So going and following a knowledge translation framework, going from priority setting to impact through a continuum is an iterative process. Of course, issue identification and understanding the problem, uh, that's where this starts, and this is where understanding the complexity uh, is important. Starting with the priority topic um, and needs of a specific country, a specific context, and conducting priority setting exercise and engaging and understanding the context as part of the priority setting. And then sometimes we need to move forward and find more evidence or find evidence uh, or, or synthesize evidence to inform the identified priority topic or build already existing, build on already existing research or develop knowledge and generate knowledge that is necessary to inform, uh, inform uh, a policymaking process. And then comes the, part, the, uh, the aspect of packaging that knowledge, uh, packaging that produced knowledge, that evidence into knowledge translation products, moving forward to facilitating uptake through conducting policy dialogue, citizen consultation dialogues, Advocacy campaigns, very important in the context of tobacco control, and I'll come to this, media, uh, society engagement, uh, et cetera. So the knowledge, press, uh, knowledge translation products are moving forward and used to guide decision making through, uh, through those uptake mechanisms. So in this process, and then this could be an, an iterative process, as I said, going back to, again to priority setting and, and so on. So what about knowledge translation in tobacco control? What makes knowledge translation for tobacco control challenging is the active and persistent threat from the tobacco industry. Remember that photo that I showed you. In the US alone, the tobacco industry has been spent nearly 1 million US dollars per hour just for marketing its tobacco product. It means that the industry needs to be consistently monitored, exposed, and its actions contested all the time. We need to advocate for their exclusion from tobacco control policy making and holding them to account. And then thinking of tobacco industry, again, this complexity, we need to consider the whole supply and sale chain. So we're not talking only about multinational tobacco industries, companies, we're talking about sale chains, allies, tobacco funded associations, third parties and front groups, retail associations, the hospitality industry and advertising, state owned tobacco companies. All those are potential points of for monitoring and potential points of entry for intervention and regulation that we need to always be aware of in when doing knowledge translation in, uh, in tobacco control. So in conclusion, as key learnings, I want to uh, pass along first that we need to think ourselves as, um, as part of a system, not isolated alone, but working uh, as academics to achieve impact because research alone is insufficient to move forward and impact public health problems and move forward tobacco control. But also acknowledge that this entails, it's a long road, it's uh, changing, it's iterating and requires um, perseverance because policymaking entails uh, being able to follow through. And in doing that, uh, thinking from a systems uh, perspective uh, and working from a systems uh, perspective. In conclusion, in an, we need to analyze, understand, and acknowledge the complexity to be able to understand tobacco control, to understand the problem and issue, to make it you know, evidence-based, more informed. And we also need to work with groups, networks, and consortiums because answering complex public health problems in a topic such as tobacco control necessitates that. Of course, keeping in mind that the tobacco industry can never partner in our knowledge translation efforts and understanding their moves and monitoring them. 
For me personally, it would not have been possible to push forward a water pipe specific research agenda in any other way, uh, uh, other than working in a multidisciplinary approach and in collaborations, because input from multiple disciplines fed into each other and informed each other. And I finally want to invite future researchers to always aim for generating impact um, using their research to achieve impact through using knowledge translation frameworks uh, to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rima. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm curious, Nicholas, if we have any questions from the audience uh, for Rima. Uh, we don't have any questions uh, yet. I, I have a question, though, for Rima. I'm curious uh, in terms of, you know, what I'm hearing is it's it's the it's a skill of moving research outside of just the research and into the world and into policy. And what's what's the one skill you would say is 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 required to do this type of work? It's a learned skill, so I want to emphasize that everybody can learn how to do it. I think maybe that what I want to emphasize also is the uh, character aspect. It's the perseverance. You cannot move forward tobacco control agendas without perseverance from the sides of the tobacco control advocates. To, to be patient because it's a long process and we are faced at, uh, by stakeholders that are unfavorable to the process and won't facilitate. Thank you, that's, that's a really good reminder. And we also have a comment about how, of course, as the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Love it, so, love it. <laughs> yes, great. Uh, so we have a short video to share uh, that gives an overview of a wide range of the projects that we've been working on. In five years, we funded 10 projects across 17 countries for which the impact goes far beyond. The Economics for Tobacco Control Research Initiative informs fiscal policies for tobacco control in low and middle income countries and informs decision makers on the urgent need for action on tobacco control as well as the benefits of fiscal policies for public health in those countries. The initiative is one of the few large research investments in the economics of tobacco control in low and middle income country settings worldwide. CL UK were really excited to form a really complementary partnership with IDRC, bringing together you know, two organizations with expertise in international development and tobacco control. And this partnership resulted in an initiative which still represents to date CRUK's single largest uh, program investment in low and middle income countries. So we know that fiscal policies for tobacco control are really effective. They cut consumption, prevent tobacco related disease, and at the same time, reduce household poverty and increase national revenue. What we need is that context specific, locally led research to provide the evidence to prove this in context. When we vetted proposals, we vetted them along, along these dimensions. So how relevant was the idea that they proposed to the context that they were working in? What is the uh, composition of the research team and uh, how they can come together? How likely were they to achieve the goals that they set? And that this was directed at change, that there was a change process that was initiated. This was not just gonna be a descriptive piece of work that would perhaps not be seen by a lot of people. That was directly linked to a change process so we could see the impact on improving people's health. So what we do is we provide mechanisms and platforms that allow researchers in, in different countries to kind of come together and learn from each other. So th through this, they have peer support and peer learning and they can build solidarity. So we fund this research, we fund these projects because we understand that increasing tobacco taxes is the simplest and most cost-effective ways for improving global public health. People can now live longer and healthier lives if we increase the cost of tobacco. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have that context and to understand the range and depth of how this work has taken place and continues to progress. Next, we have uh, Hannah Ross, 
who is uh, currently the principal research officer at the research unit on the economics of excisable products at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And she is, uh, she studies the impact of tobacco control interventions in Africa, Southeast Asia, and in the European Union. Hannah, welcome, and thank you so much for joining today. Uh, thank you, Phil, and greetings to all the participants of, of this webinar. Um, as many of you know, I'm an economist, and writing and publishing research articles is my bread and butter. Um, but I feel especially rewarded uh, when my research uh, changed policies. So, I, and I tend to ask myself, how does that happen, and what can we do so that we see more of this uh, research changing policy, more of an impact? So when I talk about my work, about the results of my work to different audience, it's really talking to economists. I mostly talk to people from the field of finance or commerce or customs. And I realize that um, for my messages to resonate, I really need to abandon my economics hat. I need to talk their language. I need to talk business kind of a language. So for example, instead of saying price elasticity of demand, I would say the sensitivity of customers to price changes. And these kind of changes in, 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 um, in conversation, changes in vocabulary really seems to make a, a quite a bit of impact. And then I realized that the same approach tends to work with funding agencies. Um, funders are in fact investors and therefore we're likely to be interested in some kind of a business metrics such as return on the investment. Uh, for example, how um, if I invest $1 of, uh, into research, how many lives I can save, or how much economic growth can this investment generate? So I know we're interested in this kind of a metric, so can this be done and calculated? Um, I think it would be tricky. It'd be really difficult to, to make that calculations, but what I know is that if funders, I can assure the funders that if there is a quality research delivered to the right audience in an appropriate package or format, it can really change policies and, and ch save lives. So let me now share with you my screen uh, where I will show you some examples on when um, I saw change in policies through the work of myself or my colleagues. So the first one is an example from chat where I wasn't uh, participating in that but colleagues from University of Cape Town from the research uh, from the economic uh, from the research unit on economics of excisable product were uh, uh, invited to chat to talk to them about tobacco taxation and November 2019 2018. They presented a model and, and show how would, would the impact of a change structure be. And they proposed a specific, I think a specific component of uh, 100 francs per pack uh, in, in, the tax, in the tax system. And then a few months later, on January 1st, we were very pleased to see that actually the new law in Chad had exactly this, that specific excise tax implemented, 100 uh, francs per pack. And we were also very pleased to then see a uh, tax scorecard report, uh, published in 2021 that actually said that one of the largest improvement in tax structures in the last, in, a, in between 2018 and 2020 actually occurred in chat. And, uh, and the very way changed the system from purely ad valorem to a mixed system and also uh, increase the, and, and now we rely, rely primarily on the specific tax. So that was really rewarding for us, for our unit to see. Then another example is from a country there where I work quite extensively and it's the Republic of Georgia. Here we see how over time we were increasing their taxes, but they also changed the tax structure to a better, to uh, evidence-based tax structure where Initially, their tax uh, rates were different for filtered for cigarettes with filters and without filters. They were different for imported products and for domestically manufactured products. But over time, as we 
uh, were providing them more and more research evidence, they managed to change the policy so now, so that now in uh, by 2019, uh, all cigarettes had the same excise tax rate. The specific excise tax rate was the same. Uh, it's the same since 2019. You can still see a, a difference in in the tax rate, and that's mostly given by the fact that they also have ad valorem component of this of the of the excise tax but the specific tax is the same for all cigarettes georgia also um, uh, um, studied the results of our research that pointed out to the fact that as we increase their tax rates the um, some people are switching to roll your own cigarettes so what they did, they, take, they, they saw the research and took it into consideration Then they revised their ta tax policy in 2019. They increased uh, excise tax rates on roll your own tobacco. Uh, they introduced a, a new excise tax on, on tobacco raw material. And it was also very beneficial for this uh, substitution. And they changed the packaging uh, rules for your own tobacco, where now you can only buy, buy packs of roll your own tobacco, but in 20, 50 grams or 100 grams. So again, you know, very responsive to our research results in Georgia. And now um, to Thailand. Um, I um, did some work in Thailand. Many of, of you maybe who are listening also did some work in Thailand. Thailand is always used as an example of a country where uh, we have success with excise tax policy for uh, tobacco products. And you can see is this, Thailand is a good example of this win-win uh, uh, story or win-win uh, situation that we always try to tell policymakers. And that is, if we increase tax, that will lead to higher cigarette prices, that will, that will reduce the sales, reduce consumption, and at the same time, increase the tax revenue. So this is exactly what we are seeing in Thailand. And we also see that this, um, this work, these higher taxes have impact on, uh, uh, on averting premature deaths as well. And the last example, it's, it's uh, probably the most dear to my heart is that when I saw this study, I felt really, really good about the, the work researchers are doing uh, on tobacco taxation. This piece of research demonstrated that higher taxes uh, not only increase prices, but they also reduce infant mortality. So, and this was done in the European Union, looking at uh, 23 European countries, where we see that this impact on decline infant mortality was uh, very significant. And not only in the year when the tax was changed, but also in the following years. So it has a lasting impact. So just between 2004 and 2014, um, this tax increase was associated with nine, over 9,000 fewer infant deaths. So you can, you know, this is something that, that us researchers are really, when we see results like that, that gets us, that uh, gives us the motivation to do even more. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, stop sharing and I go back and I sort of, um, I'll finish uh, my talk by saying that when we, when we see these policy change, um, this is when uh, we are sort of in the final stages of our research process. This is when we publish research articles, we give a presentation at the conferences of the policymakers. But these final stages do not happen without the initial stages uh, of the research. When we sit in our labs, when we run regressions with uncertain results, when we train our young academics so we can um, join our teams, and help us to generate more, more of research evidence because we need a big body of research evidence to convince, you know, to make sure that our results have a, in, enough a sufficient scientific weight. And these initial stages are very vital, yet they're hard to fund because, and then here I'm going back to the return on the investment, because the return on the investment in these initial stages is uncertain. And this is where I would like to really praise IDRC because they have the courage, IDRC has the courage to fund these initial stages of the research supply chain 
They have the courage to fund the training of young uh, academics so that we can then deliver a fine product to our final customer, be it a policymaker or a fellow researcher. So thank you, IDRC, and thank you everybody for uh, letting me to share my experiences with you on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That is such a powerful set of important ideas of figuring out how to talk the business language as necessary and then that end-to-end -end view about uncertain research all the way to policy changes is so vital and, and yes thank you so much all right our next speaker uh, i think we'll need to keep moving the program forward um, as we're a little bit behind time um, is uh, andrea uh, alcaraz uh, she is the uh, Health Technology Assessment Coordinator at IECS uh, Argentina. Andrea, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, afternoon, or evening as appropriate. I greet you all from Argentina. This story began 16 years ago, and it is still a work in progress. We started as an academic group trying to generate evidence to promote changes in policies for tobacco control to improve public health. But today, we are more than 40 researchers in Latin America and we extended to Nigeria. We are not only academic researchers, but also decision makers, civil society, and communicators from 13 countries working together in the tobacco fight. We studied the impact of tobacco use on the health, economic, and social burden. But we also estimate the expected gains of implementing the main tobacco control measures, taxes, plain packaging, advertising ban, and smoke-free environments. We have a big project. How could we assertively communicate the results of our research? We decide to involve decision makers and regional leaders from the first minute of our work. They are the ones who know the best, the best way to address the issue and what information they need to promote public policies in their countries. We discuss the results and plan the communication strategy together. Generating friendly communication materials is essential to get people to read your message and then take action. And this material must be appropriate for different audiences, decision makers, researchers, or the general population. The main piece in the communication strategy for decision makers is the policy brief with a strong visual imprint, which includes a one page summary to attract attention to the most critical research data. The numbers are shocking because tobacco causes so much damage and economic loss. This data remain in memory. For example, in the image on the left, you can see that going from strong health warnings to plain packaging in Mexico would prevent 26,000 deaths, 150,000 events, and the health system would save 37,000 millions of pesos in the next 10 years. Hard numbers. Civil society usually brings this piece of information closer to key decision makers, such as senators, deputies, ministers, etc. They serve as facilitators to initiate dialogue. These pieces are adapted to the specific information required to promote a country policy, such as a 50% tax increase in a sample, which is what the government would be willing to implement. Putting numbers on death avoided or money saved facilitates decision making. In the image on the right, 14% 14, 14 of all deaths that occur in Argentina may be attributable to smoking. The health system spends almost 200 million of pesos a year to treat related disease. Increasing the price of cigarettes by 50% could prevent 22,000 deaths and save almost 600 billion in 10 years. A top to bottom strategy like this one 
must be accompanied by a bottom to top strategy to be successful. Strong empowerment of the general population can be the engine to generate change. Press releases and conversation with mass media can bring this vital topic to the front page of one of the most recognized newspapers. This is in Argentina. Or even to live television. 650 appearances in newspapers, radio, and television are an enormous opportunity to, to communicate the damage caused by tobacco and the possible strategies to reduce its consumption. Awareness of special dates on which the population may be sensitive to these issues, such as War Non-Tobacco Day, the War Day Against Cancer, or Women's Day for gender-specific problem, is a golden opportunity. We develop social media campaigns with short messages and videos for Twitter and Facebook in those days. In this video releases on the last International Women Day, we show that up to six hours a day are spent by caregivers in charge of people with smoking-related diseases, mainly women. Researchers from other groups, health professionals, and international funders are a public that should not be neglected. Scientific publication and project-specific webinars are essential to show methodological robustness and communicate these critical results. It is also important to participate in as many tobacco control-related events as possible. And even more, local webinars showing hardcore results are appealing to civil society, health professionals, decision makers, communicators, and also for the general population. And why not train opinion formers? Both webinars and an information repository for journalists were held. Since a lot of information was generated for each country, Having everything at your fingertips on a web page is an added value. The next slide, please, Phil. Uh, you can find the information organiz organized by country, the related webinars, the repository for journalists, as well as all the audiovisual material generated during the project. When you have robust and valuable information about the impact of smoking on the health and economy of countries, thinking globally and communicating locally can enlarge the network of actors and promote change in public policies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful, Andrea such an important impact you've been able to have over the years with so many hundreds of media communications and getting that communication from a bottom up and a top down perspective is, is so valuable and important. Uh, Nicholas, did we have any uh, questions that we wanted to highlight at this moment? No questions per se, but some good conversations that are starting uh, notably around this gap uh, between you know policy implementation and and the research that's produced, I, I have a quick question for you, Andrea. Uh, okay. So you know you're you're a doctor, you're a researcher. How how do you how is it that you're you're talking about communications? How how did the how did you develop kind of this this skill set in terms of uh, I guess promoting the the results of your research? Okay, it's all about teamwork. Uh, I was learning through these 16 years how to communicate better because we are working all together, understanding the big problem. Well, great. Thank you again so much. Really appreciate uh, all the great work and um, eager to hear about where things continue to go from here. We now have a brief video which will feature uh, Ariel uh, Bardock and Adedji uh, Adeneron. Uh, who is the director of research at CSA, CSEA in Nigeria, and Ariel Bardock, who is in Argentina. This is a really great highlight of a South-South collaboration uh, that, uh, that continues to this day. Um, 
and let's go ahead and share the video. You have a very unique partnership. Can you tell us how that got started and uh, what it was like to begin working together? It was a story around the cafeteria. We met at the World Congress of uh, Tobacco or Health in South Africa and Cape Town in 2018. Um, we were both presenting our works, for our previous work uh, from Nigeria and from Argentina. And uh, yeah, we, we listened to Dr. Chukwa Onikwena and group. Um, they were um, presenting some very interesting economic evaluation on tobacco. And then we met with, with the people of IDRC, with Natasha, Madija, and Samuel. And they, we all met in the cafeteria. And then um, we started like, um, uh, realizing how many things in common we had, both groups, and, and we uh, really would benefit to work together in some projects and like began to think in ways of uh, getting funded and, and to do interesting things together to, to benefit from each other's um, strengths. I think we had this, this mathematical model and, and we had this epidemiological background and they had like a very strong uh, e e economist group um, in a way, looking back, I think it's to us um, about um, getting the mixing piece of a puzzle. Um, um, I mean, prior to our collaborations, we've been working on tobacco uh, control research, but I think we also inadequately equipped with a kind of model or tools that can make, enable us answer kind of critical questions around what is the uh, economic cost of uh, tobacco burden? Um, what are the kind of potential effect of plain packaging policy, for example? I mean, a lot of uh, uh, things are going on policy where the um, uh, model um, that we actually understand and have the capacity for um, is inadequate for. And when we see this thing actually answering almost similar question that we have in mind, with this kind of very precise uh, tools, we were very happy to say, okay, I mean, let, let's try this, but it has uh, evolved from just a trial to something like you can call a, 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 a staple in our kind of research. I mean, as like the point, first point of thinking, um, when we want to do something we can, uh, in terms of um, asking more questions and also being able to do more than we could do. So for us, this relationship is an eye opener. It's um, something that has empowered us um, to do more than we could do. Uh, 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 and, but more importantly, it reflects uh, South cooperation because we had two kind of uh, developing countries um, working together to ensure uh, that we share ideas that can in both ways develop our, uh, own knowledge, but more importantly, it shows um, the depth of um, kind of what lies ahead when uh, countries in global south comes together, interact, and can share these kind of ideas. It can actually solve a lot of problem more than we take. So it sounds like you were each able to think with more minds than were on your team and solve yeah. problems that you couldn't solve alone. Yes, definitely. Sure. And for example, we, we yeah, in, in, in some of the tools they used for um, getting the primary data in the hospitals, we, we tried to like enhance the tool in the questionnaire. And uh, also they have some, some uh, meaningful um, uh, insights on what we're doing in, in the model and what were the more relevant outcomes. I mean, deaths, uh, events, uh, quality adjusted life years or DALIs, disability adjusted life years that the model is able to, to produce in, 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 an, in an effort to quantify this burden of disease. So, so there were many, many, many interactions that in, in, from my standpoint, they were very fruit, fruitful. If there were some new researchers who were looking to start a collaboration across countries or continents, 
what would you suggest to them? The first thing is um, alignment of interests in terms of um, everyone needs to be bring something different but complementary to the table because if we're doing the same thing, it will be competition. If we are so far wide apart, there will not be point of the session. So um, it, I think that was very clear in terms of uh, uh, both teams have something to contribute. But more importantly is passion and kind of interest. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. In, in the first calls, I remember that like, both connections were choppy, where like everybody was falling of the conversation. And, and the language barrier, it, it exists, it's real. And sometimes we didn't find a common language until we found it. But the passion is was always prevailing <laughs> and was always under, under our um, conversations and, and uh, always present. So it, it's very uh, important. So yeah, we we are about to go on collaborating and include more countries, I think, in the future. So great to hear these wonderful stories and how partnerships can come together and form and create results that were impossible otherwise. Next up, we have a uh, another short video uh, that will include uh, several speakers. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, the tobacco industry works hard to disseminate certain myths around tobacco control. And this short video will provide some brief capsules uh, from several project teams uh, offering research highlights while dispelling some of those column, co common myths. So you'll see in order, uh, Anwin Nock, the chief economist at uh, DEPOCEN, uh, a think tank, in, think tank in Vietnam, Andres Pinchon Rivière, a director of the High Technology Assessment of Economic Evaluations at IECS, and Alan Joseph Santiago, program manager of the Tobacco Prevention and Control at uh, Ateno School of Government in the Philippines. So another international collaboration set of learnings. Can we show the video? Vietnam high smoking prevalence is attributable to its uh, tobacco food abilities. Uh, although the price of cigarettes has been increasing, the Vietnamese people's income is rising even faster. So over time, making the cigarette more affordable. It's, uh, it's commonly believed that by raising taxes, the poor uh, may be hurt more than uh, the rich. However, by taxing uh, tobacco consumptions, uh, the, the story is reversed. The poor will benefit more from the tax increases. But one of the reasons our research results shows uh, that uh, by increasing the tax on the tobaccos will lead to uh, higher investment into the education of the children. So by the raising uh, taxations on uh, tobacco consumption to help the poor, Tobacco taxes represent an important source of revenues for, for government and for countries. And, and this is true because they represent a revenue as taxes from other products. No? But this is just one side of the coin because actually tobacco taxes represent a revenue, but tobacco also represent a cost for, for countries and, and a very significant cost. Um, this cost is, has different components, and one very important component is the medical cost for treating conditions associated with, with tobacco. And also there are other components that are not easily measured no? and is, are not usually considered. So, for example, if there is a person in the house, the mother or the father that is ill, and because of that, uh, the children need to stop studying and start working. That is also something that will have an impact in the family at that moment, but also in the future because that person was not able to, to start. So all these components represent the cost of, of tobacco that is very significant. Um, tobacco taxes, uh, countries can only recover 15% of all these costs through tobacco taxes. This is one of the main findings of, of our study. So it's very important that countries stop 
seeing tobacco taxes as a source of revenue and start seeing tobacco as a cost, a very important cost. And this is one of the main reasons why countries need to increase tobacco taxes in the future. We did a research study focusing on a more local scale. We tried to analyze the Philippines' trend of illicit tobacco trade in the country from 1998 to 2018. Essentially, it was found that um, there's no direct relationship between tobacco taxes and tax evasion or avoidance in the Philippines. Thus, it basically debunks tobacco industry's claims that raising tobacco taxes serves as a primary reason for prevalence or increase on tobacco tax evasion or avoidance. It says that there should be no excuse, there should be no any compelling reason why we should not raise tobacco taxes if we try to look into the results of this study. So, you know, raising tobacco taxes, as the World Health Organization says, is the most cost-effective way to, um, to stop tobacco industries or to, to, pro to promote tobacco control. Great. And next, we're going to uh, follow that uh, with a shift to a, uh, a French portion of the program. I'll invite Yai Diema to join us now, so you can just turn on your camera now. Hello, Yai. Uh, how's it going? Live from Senegal today. Hello. Doing well. Thanks. Hello, everyone. So once again, thank you for being here. Yes. And rapidly, I'd like to present Yai, uh, who has a master's in rural development and cooperation from Université Gaston Berger de Saint Louis, and is also the program coordinator for the health programs at the CRES. So maybe to get started, Yai, could you set the table for us and just give us some broad strokes of, you know, what the CRES does and yeah, just set the table for us. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, hello to all. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. So quickly, the CRES is a research center with many researchers across uh, uh, multiple disciplines at the Université Cher Antadiop in Dakar, disciplines such as law, sociology, economy, and so on. The mission of the CRES is to promote quality research, both quantitative and qualitative, with a goal to equip local authorities, decision makers, policymakers, and civil society at large in the creation of policies which have economic and social implications, both regionally and uh, at national level. That's the CRES in a nutshell. More specifically, the CRES has been involved in tobacco control since uh, 2008 through an initiative called ASTA, Situational Analysis of Tobacco Usage in Africa. At the end of this study, we noted three gaps. The absence of taxation across Africa on tobacco products, the lack of policies uh, that would support the implementation of stronger taxation measures and a lack of vision from the politicians to create synergies between regional and national policy development. At the end of the study, some actions were taken, which led to two major results at the national level. The first was a law project, which was elaborated to push for stronger taxation and the second was the adoption of uh, this law project the, on March 14th, 2014, known as the 14th of March, 2014 law, which allowed to constrain uh, in some ways what the tobacco industry could do in terms of manufacturing and patch packaging, for example. And ultimately, uh, this law made cigarettes a bit less accessible to the population. Um, so I hope this gives you some context. 
Super, thank you. That really sets the table. So what I'm what I'm hearing is that you're really working on two fronts. On one end, you have the research side, and on the other end, you have the advocacy side. So how are we turning that research into policy and law changes? So thank you for that. And uh, we've also had uh, Professor Diang, who was unable to join us today, who is the director of the CRESS, but with the magic of technology. I'm just going to play a short video now. Uh, that kind of demonstrates maybe his approach uh, to this process. Perfect. Our objective uh, wasn't necessarily to present data from Western Africa because those research results did not exist yet. So we were relying on research results from partners all around the world and to present. And instead of waiting for all this research to come up in Western Africa, we said, let's let's just strike the iron while it's hot. Uh, we had a favorable context and we needed to move forward. You also need to have a little bit of guts, you know, you need to be able to knock on doors, talk to people. Uh, it's, a, it's really a relational game. You need to have confidence and be like, yeah, I have something to say and it's important. So something that stood out for me in this video is, you know, some skills that perhaps I wouldn't have attributed to research initially, you know, this ability to navigate, you know, relationships and, and work with different people. So I'd like to talk strategy a little bit, Yai, and I would invite you uh, to tell me a little bit about how you employed uh, strategies at the CRES to move towards the adoption of those new laws. So strategy, as we saw in the video, requires a lot of uh, relational work and knocking on doors. One element we can't ignore, however, is the production of convincing and reliable data and the translation of this data, which is something we need to think about so that it is uh, accessible to decision makers. There's also a need to contact key persons and we need to identify them very early on in our projects. People from border control or who work in the health administrations, for example, and also key individuals that can serve as bridges between us and these administrations. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we can build relationships higher up, which facilitates uh, holding uh, certain conversations, of course. On the research side of things, we ensure that these people have access to all the relevant information, including our synthesis documents. Then we organize roundtables, workshops, conferences, we spend uh, a lot of time repeating our key messages with a pedagogical approach to make sure that the individuals who typically serve as relays between us and the decision makers truly own these messages. It's important for us to be clear uh, and repetitive so that they may really integrate the information and understand uh, our objectives. It's only after this that we can hope to obtain some results. When large conferences are held and concerned administrations are present. For example, in the case of the creation of this new law project, we had to contact the CDAO, the community, the economic community of uh, Western African states, which is a body responsible for the economic integration of the countries in West Africa. And uh, same thing with the UMO OA, uh, the Monetary Union of West African States, which uh, has a very similar mission. We had to ensure that the members who represent different organizations were all aware of the research and our objectives right at the onset to help support the adoption of um, this new law. Thank you. And I, I will allow myself to add something, given we've had the opportunity to chat before. Uh, something I had found very interesting is how you would find members that are within the different ministries and you would integrate them into the research teams themselves. I thought that was quite interesting. So I'm, I'm also curious. So you've identified these champions, you've done all this work. And now you're sitting in front of a person with, you know, decision-making power. What does that meeting look like? Could you tell me a bit on that? 
normally if you are a decision maker uh, that we have already targeted, uh, we already have a research person that works in your administration with whom uh, you are in contact or that you know, and with whom we have been working for, at that point, at least a year. And that person is ready before we even hold the meeting. And uh, in a certain way, so is the decision maker that we are uh, going to meet. And we developed a simulation tool. Actually, it's an Excel-based tool, which enables us to predict the effects of a tax increase on tobacco products. Um, and what happens is that the person that we've been working with, the economist or the border control agent, uh, already knows how, how to use the tool. We train them for that. So uh, when we meet, we can input a change in taxation in the tool and immediately see the outcomes. So, for example, it will show that our revenue will increase by this much by a certain date if we increase taxes by such and such percentage. Um, this serves as a very powerful argument when you are in front of a decision maker, of course. Um, there are, of course, other elements uh, that we use, such as policy briefs and uh, other um, arguments, but we let the numbers really speak for themselves uh, and use that as the base for our arguments. Uh, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. So maybe one last question to close it off. You know, you spoke a lot about the different champions uh, within the ministries that, that, that help make this happen. Uh, what what words would you have to share for these champions or emerging champions? What we tell these champions is that we can't do it without them. Uh, these champions concretely helped us pass new laws. So what I'd like to tell them is keep doing what you're doing. We can't uh, achieve our results without you and really thank you. Uh, so next we have a, uh, uh, you have a research director from the Fundacio ANAS, uh, Blanca Laurent, who is a, uh, is an economist who specializes in social evaluation of projects. Uh, Blanca, please uh, unmute your microphone and we will love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. It is, uh, I hope you're hearing me well. Yes, and we hear you great. It is a pleasure to be here today and an honor to share this uh, space with so many admired and esteemed colleagues. As I am going to talk, to continue with the conversation, uh, a little bit about my own personal experience uh, uh, in a journey from research to action. And, and it's not, not only my personal experience, it's actually the, the story of Fundacion Anash and part of our, our mission. Um, okay, we're done. So uh, this journey is a story who start, that started with a researcher um, who had a, the purpose of, of, of learning and contributing to to a problem that we saw in, in, in the universities and among the youth population in Colombia. These numbers from, come from the GYTS, the journal, the, 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 the survey, the global, the global Youth Tobacco Survey. And they showed us uh, the, the enormous amount of, of uh, school students smoking in Colombia, 30.2. 30% uh, in 2001, 29% in 2008. Um, and this was a problem that I witnessed myself as a, a university teacher among my students. Um, so back in 2005, students at uh, Colombian universities were smoking as we've never seen before. So, as a researcher, what did we do? Uh, we started to address the knowledge gaps and to find uh, uh, resources to build local evidence on many things. We estimated the cigarette demand in Colombia and how it was working. As Hannah was mentioning, how sensitive the consumer was to prices. We, start, we studied uh, illicit trade 
And I have to, to mention here the incredible and courageous work of funding aid agencies such as American Cancer Society and Cancer Research UK. Nobody was funding uh, illicit trade studies at that time. Uh, and they took the chance with us and uh, it changed the, the, the dynamics of our work enormously. And then later on, we started to uh, do research in the connections between sustainable development goals and tobacco control and how tobacco control can contribute to these goals uh, in a more comprehensive way, making with these numbers, the issues more visible and hopefully creating a greater impact and policy influence as we did it. And how we did it, it was with local alliances and with researchers, uh, many researchers from University of Tolo Toronto, uh, Instituto de Salud Pública de Mexico, um, EX in uh, Argentina, many of, of, of those are present here today, but also local res researchers in Colombia, such as Proesa, uh, Universidad del Rosario, and many others. I, I, I wish I could name, name them, all, the, all, them all. I don't have enough time today. And ov obviously, again, international cooperation funding was an essential part of, of, the, of the recipe for success. But very quickly, we realized that gaining clarity on the nature of the problem and the policy interventions was not enough. Very uh, reluctantly also, we identified the need to engage with other actors to see some policy changes happening. Luckily, we found mentors to guide us, guide us in, in, in this very tricky road. Um, we were very lucky to have them. Many things, however, are only learned by self-experience, right? By practice. You need, to, you need to learn the unwritten law, uh, rules to work in Congress, to establish communication with uh, the advisors to the ministers. You need to build a reputation as a source of reliable information and to have cap the capacity to deliver results, results and interact with these policymakers under very stressful and predictable circumstances. You must develop, and many of my colleagues have mentioned this, strong coalitions. You also need to learn to identify the strengths of each organization to know what to expect, what to ask from them, and create enough trust. And I say create, because this is something that doesn't grow in the wild. You need to create and work for it. Create enough trust to make these relationships work. I can think now of many instances when our, where our team benefited from this uh, engagement effort. And again, this was, as many of my colleagues have mentioned today, systematic and persistent. Like the time we had the right messenger to deliver a recommendation to the Ministry of Finance on a, on a recommendation on tax increase or a whistleblower who warned us about some attempts to lobby against our recommendations, and we had the time to react and prepare for it. Or the possibility to position our research in the media, as you see in the examples here, uh, in relevant outlets that were you know, consulted by policymakers, by decision makers. To the left, you see one example. This was a result of a collaboration with Liga Colombiana Contra el Cancer. They had a lot of recognition and, and the possibility to enter these uh, big media outlets. And then this is one of the many interviews uh, highlighting the importance of increasing tax uh, uh, as, a, as part of the, of the policy to prevent tobacco consumption. And to the, to right, the right, you see an op-ed written by a, a former director of the Central Bank in Colombia a very well-respected economist who is quoting, citing our research. And the beautiful thing about this is we never spoke to him. It was enough to create you know, the momentum and the reputation. So we were used as a reliable source to support the argument in favor of, of tobacco taxation 
uh, in these high spheres where usually we don't have you know, the, the right the uh, reach. So again, emphasis on advocacy, but having the right partners is, is, is the key. I would like to dedicate some, some moments to, to describe our experience doing research on the connections between sustainable development goals and, and tobacco, because uh, I think there are some lessons to, to share and to, to gain here. Uh, perhaps people from the tobacco community are aware that uh, tobacco is uh, an obstacle for sustainable development. But even among our community, it's not um, it's not well known the the reach the, the the number of goals that are that are compromised by tobacco. At least fourteen of the seventeen sustainable development goals can be affected by by tobacco. But we didn't stop there, you know, uh, talking about the the impact. We tried to put numbers into this. And how we did it, uh, we use tools such as micro simulation to, um, to make this impact visible. And here are just a few examples of, of, of the, the type of calculations that, that we come up with. In terms of, of the sphere of society, we were able to calculate that in Colombia, if we increased uh, in, in, in an important amount, actually, we, if we tripled the, the tobacco tax, we would be able to avoid 30,000 poverty cases. And half of those cases are women, even though women are not big tobacco consumers. And here we started to describe all the subtle, invisible mechanisms uh, that reproduce inequalities and where tobacco plays an important role. Second, we talked about the physical environment impacts. For instance, how we would be able to prevent 1.8 billion cigarette butts. And this sounds like a large number, cigarette butts that would become toxic waste uh, in Colombia to pollute our water, to uh, damage marine ecosystems, for instance. And this is a large number, but it's a small one because Colombia is a small consumer. But even this number was you know, very impactful when we talk to policymakers, especially from the environment sector. Third, the economy. And uh, here we talked about several issues, but I would like to, uh, to showcase our estimates on how much savings in human capital losses we would be able to produce if we triple the tax in Colombia. 10.1 years of education per smoker. Those are, are huge social costs of tobacco consumption and huge social positive impacts of one single measure, such as the tobacco tax. So just to finalize, um, with a few lessons. We need to make sure to have the skills and the kind of partnerships to put research into action. We need to put forward the message of the interdependence when we're talking about development dimensions. And uh, this, I believe, must be a key aspect of advocacy to impact it, to really impact in the reduction of the burden of non-communicable diseases in the future. And we need to uh, push for more, giving more priority to intersectoral interventions uh, in order to reach uh, the objectives of Agenda 2030, now that, that we are in the countdown. Um, I'm here in, um, in Medellin, not in Bogota, in a workshop discussing psychoactive substances uh, consumption. And our facilitator yesterday mentioned something that resonated a lot, and I want to share it with you today. He said that working on prevention is a difficult field, and many practitioners leave disappointed because of the lack of results. Uh, remember the dismal figures I shared with you at the beginning of, the, of, of this talk? Now we have in Colombia one million fewer nicotine consumers. 
than six years ago. And the prevalence among uh, school students has dropped from this 30% to 8%. I'm here to tell you, it is worth the effort. It pays off to persevere. When you focus on intersectoral interventions driven by evidence, and we are not quitting, not quitting because there is still a job to be done in tobacco. And we believe there's also the opportunity to bring lessons from tobacco to other areas in public health. Well, finally, I cannot talk about Anash work without mentioning our publications. And this is a sample of our, of our work uh, done with many of my colleagues here, not uh, an isolated effort. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank all the colleagues, the partner organizations, the funding agencies. This is a collaborative effort, and I hope that you get even more inspired to do more research in this field and to really think about the strategic approach to transform research into find, uh, and findings into policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blanca. That was truly powerful. Uh, connecting things people haven't connected before, showing how knowledge is connected in powerful ways. These are all really vital things for us to keep in mind and to overcome our discouragement with the courage to see beyond it. Thank you again. Uh, next, we have uh, we have a. Prabhat Jha, who is the University of Toronto Endowed Professor in Global Health and Epidemiology at the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Prabhat, please uh, welcome, please, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jha. Thank you for being here and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Great. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, let me start with uh, some um, updated evidence reasonably updated evidence. The tobacco industry has money, we have knowledge, and we have to keep producing updated knowledge and disseminating it to decision makers. And I think it's always important to remember the key goal is to avoid a large number of deaths. And part of that is explaining the contemporary hazards of smoking. So this is some evidence from now six distinct populations showing that both in men and women, there's about a decade of life lost for a typical cigarette smoker. And that's true in the last study Richard Dahl did in UK doctors in Valerie Burrell's UK Million Women study. In the US data, which I'll uh, elaborate on in some detail in Japanese men who survived the atomic bomb and in Indian men who smoke cigarettes. And just to summarize this, this is how Brian Williams from NBC covered our U.S. studies, which are the two summarized here. And good news and bad news on the smoking front from the New England Journal of Medicine. They state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking related death risk by 90 percent compared to continuing on as a smoker. So those 22 seconds pretty much summarize my entire career of research. Uh, but let me show you some details about the benefits of stopping, because this is not widely uh, known that even among smokers uh, who are concerned about risk of death from lung cancer, that quitting by age 50, uh, even if they've started early in life, would avoid about two thirds of the excess risk of continuing to smoke. And you see this in the UK and the US. And quitting by 30 or by 40 in the US analysis gets you down to close to never smoker death rates, but not quite uh, because there's residual effects. And this is the condition that is, has the most uh, strongest relationship with uh, smoking and prolonged smoking in particular. So it is even more beneficial for other conditions, particularly heart attacks, where the effects of smoking are even bigger or effects of cessation are even bigger. But worldwide, the big problem is that there's too few uh, smokers that have quit. And this is a recent analysis <clears throat> published in Nature Reviews that looked at worldwide distributions of 
a very simple metric, how many former smokers versus current smokers at age 45 to 59 among males are there in recent years. And the darker the color, the more the cessation. So you see in Canada and the US, uh, in Australia and parts of uh, Europe, there are many more ex-smokers than current smokers. In contrast, in much of Asia, there is very little current cessation that uh, most of the smoking is uh, by current smoking, very few former smoking. But there are ex shining examples here, such as Brazil, which has very much joined the highest countries uh, in terms of being able to get uh, cessation advanced. And that's very much through the large tax hikes that occurred in Brazil. Africa is an important area of focus, but there's variability here, uh, but also uh, not sufficient data to have more definitive answers for what's happening in Africa. But the future cessation battles very much are in Asia, as you can see here. The, the yellow areas are the ones where there's simply not enough cessation. The other metric to know and explain to decision makers is a very simple one. For every million cigarettes that are sold in their country, they'll, pro they'll get one death approximately. And that's important as I'll show you to talk about the benefits of quitting. So now this is very well known to this audience. Higher taxes help current smokers to quit. And I always use the statistic now, I don't talk about a 10% higher price because that's too low. I always talk about 100% higher price because that's the range of price hikes we should be aiming for. 100% higher price would mean 20% approximately of current smokers will quit. There's greater effects in the poor and the youth. And importantly, a big single increase has greater impact than the equivalent of smaller increases. And this is important to convey to decision makers. And there's no such thing as a hardcore addicted smoker that will not um, quit because of higher prices. Um, so this, these are important points to, for us to keep conveying to finance ministers. The other concern, of course, that finance ministers raise is about smuggling. And they often point to the example of Canada. So it's important to explain what actually happened in Canada. And the short of it is this, the Canadian smuggling example was a well-organized, globally funded tobacco industry stunt meant to scare the Canadian government and others uh, about what happens if they went too high on taxes. So what you see here is in the red, starting in the early 80s or the mid 80s, the Canadian government started raising taxes um, significantly and the tobacco industry decided to make an example of Canada. And so they organized smuggling of Canadian cigarettes themselves, uh, duty-free cigarettes that went across the border back into Canada. They sent in the media to cover the smuggling and basically scared Jean Chrétien and uh, Paul Martin into lowering the taxes. And what was the net effect of that effect a reduction in taxes? Well, certainly smuggling went down because this industry stopped smuggling. Um, but the net impact of this was approximately 30 to 40 billion excess sticks uh, smoked over about a 10 year period. And if every 1 million sticks leads to one death, then roughly 30 to 40,000 deaths eventually in Canada will be attributable to the tobacco smuggling stunt. And now the Canadian government wisely caught on and they sued the tobacco industry and have raised uh, to counter smuggling and they've raised the taxes. And by contrast, you see what happened in France where there was no organized smuggling uh, efforts. And there you see a big increase in smoking or in taxes and a big reduction in smoking. So smuggling is very much manufactured by the tobacco industry. And we should keep pointing out that the consequences aren't just lost revenue, but lost lives. So what about globally? What's the best instrument that we have for reducing smoking? Well, it's the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And a recent analysis that Guillermo Paraje and we are doing is looking at very simple question, did the FCTC reduce the number of smokers? And the answer appears to be yes, uh, quite significantly. If you look at the global population, excluding China, which is an outlier, 
the number of smokers was increasing, but using an interrupted time series analysis, which is a robust way of looking at the impact of the FCTC, with more years since the ratification in each country, the consumptions actually has fallen and it's greater in the declines are greater in the younger age groups. And if we then stratify by whether the countries had high tax change or low tax change as part of the FCDC, you see a greater decline in the high tax change, exactly as we would predict. So let me conclude. Uh, prolonged smokers lose a decade of life. It's, keep, it's really important to keep emphasizing this message that applies equally to the smokers below age 30 that are just started recently in, in low income and middle income countries. Cessation is ridiculously effective, avoiding almost all of the excess risk. And the best single way to think about tobacco continues to be a large increase in the excise tax, probably paired with a modest tax on e-cigarettes to alter the market. So the key message very much we know, smoking kills, but quitting works. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jha, Prabha Jha. It's so critical to just have these super hard hitting, clear, powerful stories that tell the story about how this taxation really makes the difference. Um, so uh, we'll move to a short video that uh, summarizes some of the key uh, additional work of additional teams. There are so many unsung heroes in this field. Uh, so we will go ahead and show that. The greatest learning that we've got out of this mentorship project was the capacity building that those countries have implemented in their context. They've learned how to develop policy briefs, priority setting, advocacy, communication also when it comes to tobacco control. So far, I've done a lot of interdisciplinary research, but this one was really, really heavy on inter interdisciplinary research. And, and I, I say this in the most positive sense. That we worked on these really exciting micro simulation model. It was fun going through the process of learning how to apply that model, adapt it to the Nigeria data. And we got published in a you know, very good outlet. Because of this funding, we have been able to develop a degree of credibility, both with government and with the media that allows us to become the go-to institution when it comes to all matters related to tobacco and tobacco control. I hope for is sustainability, this work and, and growth of in, in terms of the capacity of the work that we're doing, the science that we're doing. So from our project, we were able to produce great assets that will continue to be useful for our colleagues in the region as well as globally. The research we've done is great, but we should always think of it as one step and, you know, as, as, as trying to catch up with the industry and at some, at some point, hopefully get a step ahead of them. We'll continue the work that has been started by the IDRC because in many countries, the situation is becoming more complex, especially within the context of new generation products that are coming onto the market and that are causing a whole lot of intricacies in these markets. I really wish that more of this type of experience can be implemented again because we really can't work in silos. We need to learn from the different contexts and from the experiences because effective evidence-informed decision-making cannot be done alone. We start previous to the pandemic with a plan, with an objective, and then comes the, the COVID and we survived during this time. And finally, at the fourth year, we arrived to the safe port uh, with all the people, with all the countries in the, in the project. Wow. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. We really appreciate all the incredible time and energy that you've put into this work. There are, of course, so many people who have participated, really appreciate it, every uh, bit of the effort from each and every one of our speakers. Uh, it has been an absolutely great whirlwind tour of a number of really key ideas that uh, hopefully will resonate and lead to increased and ongoing action uh, on the part of all of us as we continue to grow uh, and to connect. Um, and so thank you again. And I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Natalie and, uh, and, and, and Greg to provide some kind of closing words for us. 
Great. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I would just like to say it's been wonderful to see so many kind of female researchers presenting and kind of leading all the research products, which is, is kind of um, amazing to see. And kind of a couple of key takeaways, which I think really all of the presenters and research teams have, have harnessed on is that how important collaboration and partnerships are, um, the context that we're talking in, the language that we're using when we're advocating for change, and also the, the content and the um, credibility that all the research and evidence builds for, for all, all what we're trying to do. And those are kind of the key areas that all the all the researchers and the presenters today have um, brought for, for, for me. And I just really like to say thank you to everybody. This has been um, the biggest partnership that CRUK has had in the um, tobacco control um, global space. And working with IGRC and all the research teams has been amazing. It's been great to work with such talented, dedicated and passionate people who have really made the effort economics of tobacco control initiative a success and working together we've really seen how change can be created um, we know the tobacco industry hasn't gone away it's still there we still have a lot to do in tobacco control it isn't the the fight that has been won which sometimes can be can be seen in the, in the wider kind of ncd space and um we really just want to make more allies in in this way and we just really want to let everybody know that CRUK is committed to this space and we're going to be here we're going to be continuing to support um cancer prevention policy internationally for for many years to come and we're really looking forward to doing that through tobacco control and cervical cancer prevention programs and we're going to be continuing to support some of the teams that have been um, speaking today and as Blanca has said um, advocacy is super important it is the next stage of what we're really looking to do and trying to, to change and that is something that CRUK is now going to be focusing quite a lot of the work that we're doing as well is on advocacy as well of course the evidence base but advocacy is really key and we're really looking to build more locally led relevant and locally driven advocacy and we're really going to hopefully take lots of the learnings and partnerships that we've been able to develop within this project to the work that we're going to be doing in the future and I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's been involved I can't believe it's been five years it's gone by so quickly and like well done to everybody for what you have created and done so thank you very much and I'll pass over back to Greg. Thanks Natalie and thanks Phil and really thanks to everyone uh, warm greetings from uh, Canada and uh, I, what a privilege it is to, to wrap things up um, after all these ad admirable uh, speakers and, and their teams um, and yeah, I echo your words, uh, Natalie, uh, really great to see some powerful women uh, sending their really, really great messages. I just want to hone in on, on one additional message. Um, I think today we've seen again how the, uh, the researchers, the advocates and the institutions within countries of the global south, south have, have had the capacity to lead the national and global agenda for tobacco control. Um, and that for 28 years, since 1994, has been IDRC's approach to uh, a continuous, uninterrupted support to the tobacco control movement. We're pretty proud about, about that. And, um, and you know, it's all about ensuring that the evidence that's built for policy change is led and done by those who know the context best and who are in the best position to drive change. Otherwise, I, I think the, the other messages that have been sent loud, loud and clear numerous times today. The, the partnerships, the, the allies and alliances that are necessary to build credibility. And in the case of this initiative, particularly the economics credentials that are needed by the tobacco control movement to, to move policy and particularly fiscal policies. Um, also a, a really key um, element of this initiative has been the networking and sharing across projects, across regions and continents. Um, we started that from the outset. We knew that was largely a part of the tobacco control movement anyway, that really helps to reduce the loneliness of, of uh, tobacco control when you're working alone, you really need that, that, that courage and encouragement from colleagues across the world. And we tried to build that into the, the initiative as well. And that's worked well. Finally, I just wanna say thank you again. It's been a privilege uh, to be part of this initiative. Um, thanks to all the speakers and your teams today. Thanks to Phil and the facilitators from the SIA partners. And thank you. Natalie and the whole Cancer Research UK team have been great partners throughout and uh, yeah, really encouraging everyone to keep on. And also finally, to just join us for the interactive sessions that are going to start now too. So we can have a bit of back and forth and exchange. So over to you, Phil, thanks. Thanks so much, Greg and Natalie.
Uh, remember, of course, there's always more to learn and to connect. And you know, here's the website for you to continue uh, the conversation. 